Thanks for joining us on Insight. I am Elizabeth Omori and compliments of the season. I will be anchoring alone on this edition. My colleague Namdi is on an official assignment. We will start with the season, the birth of Christ, a time of spiritual reflection on the importance of the foundation of the Christian faith. What is the significance of the festival and how can we leverage on the birth of Christ for divine intervention, considering the trying times we are in? We have a priest and a vicar to enlighten us. Ahead of the busy schedule of the Christmas and New Year season, safety is key on our roads. No doubt the season calls for heavy vehicular movements. What is the Federal Road Safety Corps doing to reduce road carnages? What are efforts in place to make the roads safer at this time and beyond? The Corp Public Education Officer will share some of their plans to make the holidays crash free. 16 days of activism of sexual and gender-based violence over and we hear recommendations are yielding positive results. We will be recalling a conversation on sexual and gender-based violence in the course of the program. So sit back and let's get started. Christmas is celebrated to commemorate the birth of Christ and it is an annual festival observed primarily as a religious and cultural celebration around the world. It is a feast central to the Christian liturgical year. What is the significance of this celebration? I have with me in the studio great men of God, Reverend Father Nebo Boniface Omojo, Associate Priest, St. Benedict Catholic Church, Lokogoma, and Reverend Obum Nadi, Vicar, St. Andrew's Anglican Church, Gishiri. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on Insight. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, I would like to start with Reverend Father Nebo. The birth of Christ has the foundation of Christian faith. It's more than the annual celebration. Could you enlighten us on the nativity? The birth of Christ, um, rightly understood as the, as the nativity of Jesus, is a point in human history where God himself decided to come dwell amongst men. And this in itself has a salvific nature or character. That coming is for a purpose. And let us recall that the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14 rightly makes that very clear, that the world became flesh and dwelt amongst us full of grace and truth. But preceding this, something you know, uh, necessitated that willful desire of God himself to come dwell amongst men. Yeah. The original friendship, the original union, the original beauty that humanity enjoyed was fractured, was broken, was wounded as if at a point in history. And this was occasioned by the act of disobedience by our first parents, Adam and Eve. And because of this, man became helpless. Helpless man, therefore, could not help himself anymore. And it is the desire of God to restore what has been lost. And this necessitated the initiation of the whole process through the Old Testament, the words of the prophet. Then, in the New Testament, Galatians 4 verse 4, the Lord says, In the fullness of time. It means at the desired time by the Lord, he came to dwell amongst us in order to restore what was lost, the happiness, the joy, the peace that man needed but was formerly lost. All right, Reverend Obum, uh, of course, it's the season of sharing, caring, and sharing love. What would be your interpretation of nativity? Yeah, nativity of Jesus Christ, as rightly said, simply means God's incarnation in human form is a, is, a, is, a, is a day of celebration. It ought to be a day of celebration in that the broken relationship that happened in Genesis chapter 3 was restored. If you remember in verse 15, the Bible says, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Now in the New Testament, after the prophecies in Isaiah, the New Testament Jesus Christ came to fulfill the mandate of God. In this mandate of God, the lost relationship is now restored. The fallen nature of marriage is restored. For us to be restored back to our former place, our former state, it ought to be celebrated. And this time, 
all over the world, I want to make an, a point, not only Christians, because Christ came in salvation not for only Christian. Salvation is for the whole world. For God came into human form to restore man back to himself. So whosoever believes is saved. So it ought to be a day of celebration, a day of rejoicing, because our fallen estate is now restored. All right, uh, Reverend Nabel, considering the current times we are in, we are gradually winning the war against uh, kidnapping and banditry. And with the new variant of coronavirus, divine intervention is needed. Aside the celebration, what can we do? Yes, it is right and just that um, in the midst of all that has enveloped the world, the crisis, the violence, the kidnapping, who is Christ and what was his mission? He is the Prince of Peace. If men and women have peace in their heart and they allow themselves to be fully disposed to live out the peace that Christ has brought to the world, the Lord says, I give you peace, my peace I give you, the peace the world cannot give. First, the personal disposition that we all need to have, how many of us are having it? And by the way, like Reverend Riley said, it is not about religion, Christianity, Islam, this and that. It is first about humanity. At his 76th birthday last year, His Eminence John Cardinal Naikon made a very passionate appeal, which was one of the, the messages I, I looked at just last night, then I shared too. A passionate appeal that we need to hold our hands together and work for the common good of our country, Nigeria, and of course, invariably, universally, everywhere in the world, by allowing peace to reign in our hearts. Let re religion or any form of sentiment not blind us from appreciating our common humanity. You must first be human before you have a religion, uh -huh. or before you are a Christian or a Muslim. So, and I want to say that our fundamental religion is humanity. So until we learn to appreciate that, then we'll continue to still be living in deception. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and finally, we need to pray. While we dispose ourselves to work for peace at all, at all levels, let us intensify our prayers for the world. Not forgetting the, the fact that we are enveloped with the pandemic and new variant, the Omicron variant already ravaging. We need to intensify our prayer, but ultimately cooperate with the medical personnel who have been given the right ingenuity and wisdom by God to direct us on this course. I want to admonish preachers and pastors everywhere to continue to talk even more and educate their congregation with the power of the pulpit. All right, uh, thank you so much. Reverend Ogun, before I take you on the issue of nation building and the role of the church, national peace is key in everything we do, as well as governance. How do we foster national peace? Thank you. Jesus came to restore humanity. If we must embrace peace and inculcate peace, in our nation, we must acknowledge the salvific work of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came and died for the whole world. And he gave us the principle of love. The whole law of Christ is summarized in two. Love God and love humanity. Love your neighbor. So when we embrace the peace Jesus Christ gives us in this world, we, don't, we can't be talking about peace. Peace is not verbalized. It is realized. It is experienced. When we live by what we have, the attributes of God in us, when we express the attribute of God, which is peace, we may have peace in our environment. And there will be national building which is inculcated by the peace of God. Thank you. All right, I, I, I would agree with both of you that prayer is key. It's very important. It's actually an aspect of intervention in solving problems. But aside the celebration, we're in the season already. I believe the church play an important role in nation building. How do we leverage on the birth of Christ to surmount the challenges confronting us as a people? Thank you. As we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, first of all, we must understand the two key words in Christmas. Okay. Christ and the Mass. 
But unfortunately, many people have thrown away the Christ, the subject, in the sentence or in the statement. And they are celebrating. There's no how you can celebrate. There's no how you can feast in the name of Christmas without Christ. So, I, the, the crux of the whole matter lies on understanding what we are celebrating. Christ did not come to establish a religion. No. He came to save the whole world. He didn't come to save Christians. Uh -uh. It's not nowhere in the Bible. Christ came to save the whole world from the fallen state. And so as we celebrate Christmas, we should remember the work of Christ, the work of salvation. Christians all over the world, Muslims, whosoever is created by God, should receive the the Bible says in Acts of Apostles chapter 12 verse chapter 4 verse 12 salvation is not in any other name except the name of Jesus Christ as we celebrate we must have it in our mind that salvation is only in Christ not just celebrating not just eating rice not just uh, uh, playing knockout or whatever whatever we must Embrace the man of celebration who is Christ Jesus Christ. Except to embrace him, our celebration is in vain. All right, uh, Reverend, I would like to, you to comment. I would like your thoughts on the issue of tolerance because you made a statement Christianity is a way of life. And how come we have so much intolerance? How do we bridge the gap to bring us together? I would like your thoughts before I go to uh, Reverend. Thank you. The whole work lies. In Christianity, in Christians, those that profess to be Christians, they should understand the work of Christ. Tolerance. The Bible says, your nearest neighbor is your brother. Yeah. And do to your brother as you wish him to do for you. There's no place the Bible says, deal differently with an Islam or a Hindu or a traditionalist. Anybody around you is a brother. You must show the person the love of God and the peace he has brought to us. So Christianity is a way of life. Christ has come to show us love. Love should be expressed among everyone. But as a follower of Christ, I must live up to what Christ has done in my life. I don't need to tell the whole world I'm a Christian. My life should express the attributes of Christ whom I profess. Thank you. Reverend Nedu, I need your thoughts on tolerance. Yeah, it's very, very key, very, very important and integral to say. Um, talking about tolerance, I want to also use another adjective to deepen the understanding and how this can be better expressed. I want to say accommodation. Oh. Yes, accommodating one another. And just like you rightly asked, at the root of it all is, Yes, very simple word, but most abused, most adulterated, love. Hmm. See, the Greek people have this word they call kenosis. Kenosis means self-emptying, self, to be self-effacing, to be self-sacrificing for the sake of others. At the foundation of either tolerance or accommodation of one another is the fact that you know, take for instance the religions, major religions, apart from the traditional in this country, Christianity and Islam. They are so common on many grounds, but very minute differences. Therefore, you need to accommodate the little difference I have with you, and both of us can cohabit together in the same land and country called Nigeria, and there will be peace. Is when a Christian becomes an extremist propagandist of his faith, or a Muslim brother or sister become an extremist propagandist of Islam, then that is where there will be a problem. It means the faith is being forced on others. But with accommodation, understanding that these are two roads leading to the same destination, uh -huh. it means Christ is still at the center of all of this. Okay, next to that, which is rooted in love, is patriotism, love of motherland. Oh. Difference, we have nowhere except this country. If it is good, it is good for all of us. If it is bad, it is bad for all of us. And the consequences of either ways is still going to be with all of us. So let us therefore choose to make it good. Love for motherland, love for country will make us to be patriotic citizens. That I'm driving on the road for a stand. Oh, the red light is showing already. I'm in. 
It's telling me to stop. Uh -huh. I don't need any policeman around to just make me know that. Oh, come on, it's not my turn. It is turn by turn, and tell everybody who move. And you see, but when I put head, there's already going to be killed because those permitted to move will come, and there'll be a jam lock. And unfortunately, if others are followed, but when the Lord catches up with me, I say it's the devil. No, I'd rather be, I am the devil at that particular time for being unpatriotic. So, at the root of it all is, while we seek to say tolerate, um, I want to use the word accommodate because sometimes tolerance, if you take it too long, it has, you know, a limit. And you know, when you tolerate something, you may get to that breaking point. It's like, no go gray, no go gray again. While I'll come oh, so, so that is always the issue. So we can actually, actually accommodate one another. And Christ has just perfectly given us an example of what I mean by the kenosis of the self, the self-emptying of the self, okay? He says in the Gospel of John, okay, what love can a man have than yeah. to lay down it's his like life for, for another, for his friend? It means take less of myself, more of the common good, more of what makes Nigeria work and what makes Nigeria better for all. For all. Okay, now, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Boom, uh, uh, let's talk about the society and church. Looks like there's a striking force between the church and society. And then most times when we come together to talk about how to build peace, how to be, how to live in, in harmony, looks like the society tends to open the gap. How can we bridge bridge this gap between the society and the church to have a better nation thank you uh, let me come from this way i am thinking that the society is looking at the church to bring solution in that the society believes that coming from the church one must have encountered the man of the church, mm -hmm. who is Christ himself. The healing of our society should come from the church in that the church should reflect the true image and attribute of Christ. Especially this time of Christianity, I mean Christmas. If everyone in the church should really practice what we profess to be. For instance, I am a Christian. Why? Because I have encountered Christ. I've been discipled by Christ. My life should reflect Christ whom I serve. Church people who are in the society should reflect the seed of Christ in the society. When the church is good, of course the church is in the society, mm -hmm. the society must be good. I want to encourage church people, Christians, let the Christ in our life reflect the life we live. It will bring healing to our society because the society is looking up to the church. To bring healing and, and salvation. Our Reverend Nabo, let's have your take on the church and society. The church, let's not forget, exists in a culture, exists in human society. Hmm. Even Christ himself lived in a in culture, culture, in a particular society at a particular time. Of and he course. had a purpose to transform the ills of the society. Whatever does not glorify God or whatever man does that will affect his relationship with God and wouldn't make his life in his society better. My dear friends, we can actually enjoy this earth and still go, have, go to heaven and the enjoyment continues. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, His Holiness, now we send. Pope John Paul II had an encyclical called Familiaris Consortio. That is the way of the family. It's about family and human life. And in number 14 of that document, he says, the way of the family is the way of the society. And he continues, if we have good families, we're going to have good societies. If we have bad families, we're going to have bad societies. But if we have the both, good and bad, we're going to have an admixture of both good and bad in the society. And you agree with me, that actually, that is what we have. Because it, it would be a very uh, huge fallacy of hasty generalization to say that <laughs> The society is totally bad. No, that's not true. There are good people in this country. There are wonderful Nigerians in this country. But the silence of the good, the silence of the good few people oh. has made the very few bad to become so pronounced. So with this dialogue of social engagement, society and church 
can rub on themselves and okay. the purpose of the church in the society can become better expanded and expressed and immersed with great impact of transforming lives. So borrowing the words of Reverend again, we have to live out the virtues of the faith. And this time around, I want to speak beyond the borders of uh, religion, be it a Christian or Muslim. The human person is intrinsically good. The corruption mm. comes from not living the values of the religion or faith that we profess. Mm. profess. Oh. Islam has very powerful and wonderful... I did fundamental Islam and Arabic in my seminary days. You may be surprised. But all of these exposed me, and currently as a fellow of the Cardinal Nikon Foundation, I have most of my friends are imams. Most of my friends are Muslims. And you discover that a lot, a lot. The wahala we have is a product of ignorance. And, you know, Hosea says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. knowledge. So we have a task to do, to continue to do what in the language of the church we call catechesis, meaning ongoing teaching. Hmm. While, we, while we preach, let the catechesis be more in practicing what we preach. And I'll finish on that question with the, with the words of Pope Pius, you know, the, the, the thought. He says, the world is in need of witnesses. Those words are from Evangelist uh, uh, Nosiandi. See, the world is in need of witnesses. And if they would listen to preachers, it is first and foremost because they are witnesses. So it is more about our lives in society and immersing or practicing the virtues of our faith, either as a Christian or more as a priest and also as an imam out there or more as a Muslim out there. I tr trust me. The work is seen living out the values. And that is where we rub on ourselves, the church state relationship. And of course, not to talk of the big, big meetings, conferences, and all of that. All of this is for a better society, but we can get there gradually. It, it, it yeah. means in building a better society, it has nothing to do with religion, but you as a person. Now, you talked about the issue of the family. There are several vices yeah. kidnapping, rape, banditry robbery, all sorts. Has the family system failed? With love and understanding, families will continue to get better. I want to hammer very seriously on parental responsibility yeah. and the reign of parental negligence in our time and in our generation. Please, parents, be sensitive to the utterances and body language of children that speak volume. And correcting children, this time, don't even shout on them. When you shout, they withdraw. Hmm. You pamper them, engage them. They will tell you. And when certain things are revealed, we can follow them up. Interesting. All um, right, uh, quickly, Reverend, I'm sorry, I can't take yeah. much from you anymore. Right. But Reverend uh, Obum, we're counting down to 2022. From the angle of the church, what should we be expecting? Thank you. All hope is not lost. So long as Christ is our Lord, I see there's still hope in Nigeria. Oh. Only and only if we can utilize this season very, very well. This is the season to reflect back to peace. For Isaiah chapter 9 says, Unto us a child is born, and a son is given. He shall be called the Prince of Peace, for the government shall be upon his shoulder. Let us utilize this season, remembering that the Prince of Peace has been born. And as we are looking up to 2022, I am believing God. God is still the owner of this nation, Nigeria. He has never given up on us, and we must anchor our hope in him. I am believing God, so long as God is God. Nigeria is still hopeful in 2022. Thank you. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your time on Insight. Thank you for your thoughts. You're welcome. God bless you. Thank you very much. The roads are quite busy this season, and oftentimes we ask what the rush is all about. Multiple reports say the Federal Road Safety Commission recorded a total of 2,471 deaths and 5,320 road crashes across the country between January and June 2021. Now the rush is here. What are the plans in place to reduce carnages on our roads during and after the festive period? My guest, B.C. Kazim Corp, Public Education Officer of the Federal Road Safety Corps, will respond to the issue before us. Mr. Kazim, thank you so much for joining us on Insights. 
Thanks for having me. Well, the season is here and the rush is also here. How prepared is the core to saving lives and property? Well, as very ethical of us, as is a tradition of us, uh, traditional rider, we have started uh, what is known as uh, Ember Months campaign as far back as uh, uh, September. We realized uh, early enough that uh, there's always an increase in vehicular and human traffic during this period for so many reasons. The Uletide is there and uh, the people want to rush. Uh, some people believe what they have not achieved in uh, uh, eight months, they should achieve in four months. Okay. Uh, some commercial drivers believe this is time to make uh, more money, uh, to make more trips, to overspeed, to overtake, and uh, make more money to make uh, ends meet, and to even be able to provide for their family. Uh, there's also always uh, this mythical uh, belief that uh, the spirits are locking around uh, during this period and uh, we believe uh, ember months are, are very mysterious they are capable of uh, uh, wiping up uh, a lot of uh, lives they will leave a leak uh, blood and the rest but we want to say no frsc uh, realized that uh, there's always human and vehicular uh, uh, traffic more during this period and that is why we prepared as far back as September to start to do what is known as motor park rallies, to start to do education, advo uh, advocacy, and sensitization to allow people to know that uh, only the living celebrates. You can only celebrate mm. if you are alive. And what you have not made in eight months, you cannot longer make now. You just have to calm down and make sure that uh, whatever happens, you abide by it. If you have money, you celebrate. If you do not have money, you equally uh, celebrate as others. So, and uh, because there will be holidays around uh, the end of the year, a lot of people, whether Christian or Muslim, will equally travel. And because of this, we we started with uh, uh, what is known as a flag off of Ember Month, uh, so, sometimes in De Delta State, that is national one. And we ask all our commands to equally flag of their own ember months and start to move from one motor park to the other, okay. from one institution to the other, from one organization to the other, from one, one mosque to the other, from one church to the other, or even from one school to the other, to continue to sensitize the, uh, others. And in uh, December, as early as uh, uh, 15 or there, I mean 13 or thereabout, we're in Kano, equally to flag of the end of the year, the one we know as Operation uh, Zero, Tolerance for uh, Road Traffic Crashes. We have a flag of that one, and all others are supposed to take you. And we, this year, we decided to do what is known as a uh, operation uh, show of readiness. Okay. You, that is to let tell, let people know, sensitize people to know that we are ready. And we have sister agencies uh, collaborating with us: uh, army, military, police, civil defense, Red Cross. Uh, first aiders and all, even fire service. We we went around the town, most towns, about eight places pilot to show people that we are ready. And at this period, we have established about 200 mobile courts. It's not going to be a uh, business as usual. So if you commit an offense, you are likely to find yourself behind bars. So some magistrate will decide to say, look, you are not going home. Go to, 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 to jail, so to say. So it's not going to be business as usual. Be very careful. There will be sporadic operations to arrest uh, traffic offenders while public education will continue. I would like to take you on the issue of night traveling. Actually, it is not an option at this time. Are there plans for those that are neck bent on traveling at night since the mandate is all about saving lives? Yes, we have what is known as skeletal uh, rescue operations in the night. Really? Yes, okay. uh, we are extending the patrol operations from 7 p.m. in the night to about 10, 11 uh, p.m. So that uh, in a situation where there's a crash or as an accident, the, if you call 121 or if you are, if you are alerted, uh, people will move. It will not be a situation where they will say nobody is on the road. Though you should be aware that we do not patrol in the night for, for obvious reasons, but at the same time, Rescue uh, teams will be available in all 
uh, commands of a Federal Reserve Tico nationwide. And if you call on 122 or you alert any uh, road safety official or road safety team, then we'll go there. But at the same time, we are saying that night journey, if you can avoid it, please do. But if you cannot, know that there are hazards driving at the night. The, the associated hazard, the associate, associated troubles driving at the night. So be more careful, be more cautious, and drive to stay alive. Drive to stay alive. Now let's compare the campaigns. Would you say the campaigns have yielded positive results over the years till date? You see, when we look at uh, uh, crash rates, there's something that is always missing. People look at number of crashes. Mm -hmm. Campaigns are going on, yielding result, but coupled with enforcement. Because Nigeria situation here, we have realized that uh, most of the time, advocacy, education without enforcement is like entertainment. Mm. People do not want to believe. If you arrest someone now for, let's say, uh, an infraction, he's going to tell you it just happened. Probably you said, uh, your side mirror is broken. Or somebody just threw stone at me and uh, got broken. Get that person tomorrow, he's going to tell you the same story. Get him after tomorrow, day after tomorrow, the same old reason. But the moment that person is given a citation to go to uh, FRSC office to make payment or to be prosecuted, you'll see that uh, he's going to change his ways and the story will change. But by and large, campaign coupled with enforcement will always make us to behave well. Yeah, okay. Over speeding and overloading are the major challenges uh, we believe the core face every virtually every day but this season is peculiar how do you intend to handle this because virtually everyone traveling wants to move their stuff to wherever they are going to we are prepared from the 21st or thereabout the office will be shut down nationwide and we'll all be on the road even the, the commercial and the management will move uh, on uh, to the road to ensure that uh, we enforce the law speeding we have enough uh, radar guns to detect over speeding and we overloading, we are if equally ready to drop any excess passenger. Uh, so do not be allowed to be over to be an overloaded passenger because at the end of the day, you will be the loser because eventually we will drop you. Probably sometimes we will look for a vehicle for you, but the inconvenience will have been there. So what we are advocating is do not allow your vehicle, I mean your vehicle, your person as a person rider to be an overloaded passenger. And for speeding, know that speed kills. It trips, but it kills. So in that wise, make sure you use what is known as common sense speed. There are times we don't even want you to go to as much as that 100 kilometers per hour that is stipulated. We want the situation where you use common sense speed to uh, determine the traffic situation, the road condition. We call it determine the speed you, you, you go. You don't say because uh, 100 kilometers is stipulated and there's a bad road and you are going on 100 kilometers per hour. We are fully ready with radar guns, with uh, traffic coming and the rest, and our people will be there to effect arrest eventually if you are caught. Okay, I, I, I need to be clear, we need to be clear on the issue of passengers overloading themselves because that would create, create a problem. If the FRSC officials are saying, no, you are overloaded, we have to put you in another car or get you another vehicle for your load, there's going to be a challenge. There's probably going to be a problem. Once an offense is committed, an offense is committed. Mm -hmm. And if you have allowed yourself to be an overloaded passenger, whatever repercussion is yours. But what, what we do is we're already working with the stakeholders. We're working with AURTW, uh, Road Transport Employees Association of Nigeria. We're working with NATO and even no pen for your petroleum tanker drivers. They are aware that what we are doing is for their own sake. And what we do is we collaborate. Where we need a vehicle, we quickly call them and say, send us a vehicle. We have discovered some overloaded passengers here. And uh, the journey continues. Instead of uh, making sure that uh, people are stranded uh, in, in, the, in the midst of uh, their journey. So uh, the plan B is there. And we are working hand in hand with the stakeholders in the transport uh, uh, community to make sure that uh, everything is uh, going on, I mean, should be going on fine. Okay, I'll take you back to the issue of the mobile courts that will 
would be on the road to check the activities of drivers and commuters as well. How effective are these courts? And will they be functional at this period? Uh, you imagine you are traveling to Ilori and you are caught around Lokoja, maybe about five or ten offenders at the same time, and look at the court proceeding alone. Mm. It's just like a normal court where somebody is, uh, is uh, arranged and uh, a, a, a judgment is pronounced. And the judgment you cannot predict. Somebody can ask you to, to, to be taken to jail from there. Uh, it could be one day, it could be two days, but it's, I mean, you have been convicted. Two days. Yes. And uh, <laughs> sometimes they, you are asked to pay money that is even above the prescribed fines for the offense. Probably you, you've done uh, obstruction. And obstruction, ordinarily to FRSC, maybe it's 2,000 naira. Mm. And they're asking you to pay 20,000 naira. And if you cannot uh, get it, probably you, you, are, you are taken to custody. That's so like 200%. People do not want mobile court. Mm. And we're using this to serve as deterrent to other uh, uh, people that may want not to know that they should drive normally during this period. So what will be your message to drivers now that 2022 is drawing near and New Year is coming? Uh, drivers, you must know that you have loved ones. And it is when you are alive that you, have, that you can, pro can provide for your loved ones. You cannot be, I mean, nobody can be father to your children more than you. So if you have every opportunity to save your life uh, through uh, being defensive driver, being cautious driver, try and do that so that you know that in 2022 and above, you'll be, a, 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 let's say, a, a born-again driver and you continue to live. And if you are a passenger, do not be passive. Be an active uh, passenger. You have every right to stop that driver before he kills you. Hmm. Drivers do not die as much as passengers in crash scenes. They sometimes are able to observe what they could see uh, timely and they protect themselves and they, they endanger other people's lives. And sometimes too, they are, they, they are not in multiple, they are, you are about 20 or 10 or 8 in your vehicle and driver is just one. So we are saying that the future lies ahead of us and it's only, I mean, we have our lives in our hands. Be a defensive driver if you are driving. Be protective, be very cautious. Know that life has no duplicate and it is only when you are alive that you can celebrate. It's only when you are alive that you can train your loved ones and that you can be loved by your loved ones. Drive to stay alive and drive to save a life. Hmm. Drive to stay alive. Bisa Kazim, Public Education Officer, Federal Road Safety Corps, thank you so much for your time on Insight. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a gender activist on sexual and gender-based violence, and we hear recommendations made at different fora during the commemoration of the 16 days of activism on sexual and gender-based violence are yielding results. Let's recall that conversation. Sexual and gender-based violence is a serious issue globally. Critical actors in a fight against the menace are not letting their guards down as they intensify to eliminate it. In commemorating the 2021 16 Days of Activism campaign against violence on women and girls, some critical actors in the fight are advocating synergy with relevant security agencies, while some are of the opinion that the provision of specialized courts to handle such cases remains the way out. How do we eliminate the menace and make the society safe for all? These and other questions will be answered by Hanatu Essien, Program Officer, Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Program of the British Council. Mrs. Essien, thank you so much for joining us on Insights. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. 16 days of activism get towards eliminating sexual and gender-based violence. This is observed every year. What is the strategy this year? Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. For this year, the focus, the focus of the campaign is around um, increasing advocacy, awareness and innovation around prevention of um, sexual and gender-based violence against women. 
-hmm. And for us, um, we are happy to support that campaign and also be to actively participate in it. And for us at the Rule of Law Anti-Corruption Program, this year we are focusing around the imperative for uh, specialized courts. And the reason why we are doing that is to also, you know, push for the designation of specialized courts that will also support the timely dispensation of cases of, of uh, sexual and gender-based um, cases that, ha that always have a way of spending too much time in courts and thereby depriving survivors of justice. Well, uh, before we go to the issue of specialized cuts, most states are embracing the VAP Act, which is quite encouraging, yes. but a lot still needs to be done. Are there other areas we are not exploring in tackling the menace? Yes, um, there are various um, aspects of sexual and gender-based issues that, um, that have not had, had enough efforts around, particularly around, as you said, um, states that have not passed the violence against um, persons uh, laws in the states in, our, in Nigeria. Um, we have a lot of states who ha have not done that and we are hoping that um, when it, they are, they'll be able to domesticate some of those laws and then the implementation of these laws are very very important. Aside passing it is not enough to pass. You must also be seen to implement and enforce the laws. That is what will also you know cause the change that we are hoping to get. Institutions are clamoring for the establishment of special courts to try SGBV cases and from every indication looks like Lagos State is the only state for now. Why is that so? Um, of course, because I know the EU is doing so much to ensure that we have specialized courts across the states. Yes, um, we've had commitments from the Honorable Attorney General um, early this year, and even previously we've had, you know, calls and advocacy around the, um, the passage around the designation of courts. But we know that is not something that can be achieved in a day. And as such, we know that um, there's a judicial process that must be adhered to before we have these courts uh, to be uh, specially designated. And we understand that, you know, it takes time, but we know that if you have um, the political will and the commitment to that process, it is possible. And I, th and I know that these challenges can be overcome where we have um, the commitment of key stakeholders like the Federal Ministry of Justice, we have the, um, the judiciary and other institutions that can put their hands together and ensure that it happens. We know that there's the issue of funding, there's the issue of um, training too and capacity building for um, personnel for these courts that will be eventually, hopefully will be eventually be established. So we know that, we, that you know, there are these areas that need, need to be um, looked at. But that should not be that should not deter us from you know pushing for us to achieve our objectives. Okay, I would like to. Uh, I, I need to show in lights in Nigerians on the issue of the courts. Are there efforts in place to make the states adopt the specialized courts to fast track delivery of justice and protect survivors? Because uh, we understand that some most times the survivors are actually shamed while the perpetrators are not named. Yeah. Okay. You see. It, it all boils down to um, what is really the interest of the, you know, the, the government at, that, at every point in time. And for the states, we know that you know, they have the autonomy to decide on where they're going to focus their efforts on for governance. But we know that um, um, survivors are found everywhere in Nigeria. They are in every state. And the numbers are, of course, as we have said, disproportionate to numbers of um, uh, violators and numbers of persons that have been prosecuted. I mean, if you compare the statistics, and these are, this is just a, microco a, a microcosm of people that uh, have access services at the sexual assault referral centers. For this, over um, the eight years that we established these centers, so we have only 21, about 21,000 people that have reported and have access services. This is in Nigeria with a population of almost 200 million. That is just a drop in the ocean. And these are for even reported cases. Can you imagine the numbers of unreported cases? And then conversely, also imagine the numbers of you know perpetrators that are going on day by day. You are living side by side, not even knowing that what they have committed these offences. These survivors are there carrying the trauma of these um, violations, and there is no justice for them. 
And so whatever we are doing, whatever efforts that the rule of law anti-corruption program and other you know, like stakeholders in the sector are doing is not even enough. And that is why we are calling on the government, you know, to also put, you know, we know that the government is doing its best, but we want them to also focus on this aspect because we believe that when you have timely dispensation of justice, then it encourages the survivors to speak out more. It now shows the government, you know, is working even harder to protect, you know, the victims and, you know, of survivors of SGBV in Nigeria. And as such, we are hoping that this will also be, will be you know, some form of deterrence to, um, you know, perpetration of this uh, kind of um, violence that occurs on a daily basis okay I would like to bring your attention to uh, the, the issue raised at different fora on the 16 days of activism mm -hmm. campaign now uh, the issue of evidence collection yeah. analysis and storage so okay. what is Rolak doing in this regard okay um, I mentioned that RULAC has 32 sexual assault referral centers. We, we offer forensic examination of survivors. So we have specially trained uh, medical personnel who offer services to any survivor that walks into the sexual assault referral center. And those, uh, the evidence that is collected is based on, you know, the trainings and guidelines that have been provided. But you see, we need to also increase advocacy around, um, you know, knowledge of this kind of issues a lot the, the, the you know the first instinct when you, you when you when this kind of thing happens to you or a family member is to what is to clean up and as such that destroys evidence that can easily you know that would have been used you know to to you know solidify your case in court and thereby you know hopefully lead to some a positive prosecution of um uh, of of this kind of cases so you, but for us what Rolak has done is by providing expertise, experts in 32 SACs who are there to collect evidence and to help you build a case per, if you want to, you know, pursue justice. We know that a lot of Nigerians are not, and, and around the world, you know, are not really keen on pursuing justice because of what you mentioned earlier, was shaming of victims. This is a key issue. However, you know, Rolak is doing its little bit to ensure that what your evidence is properly documented. But you see, um, the issue of gender-based um, violation is pervasive. Mm -hmm. And as more particularly, even in community areas, there's the issue of, uh, we have other endemic drivers of um, these kind of um, issues, poverty, illiteracy, mm -hmm. and you know, Rolak is doing its own efforts at, you know, community engagement by, you know, going out there and talking to people. We have people that are trained. We have supported a lot of uh, civil society organizations that, you know, engage with community um, organizations and also engage with other um, civil society organizations at community level to raise awareness around these issues and also to raise awareness about the existence of the sexual assault referral centers. When people's rights are violated, the families seem to play little or no role in helping our survivors get justice. What should the family units be doing? The family needs to be aware of um, their environment, number one. Okay. And they need to also educate their, the members of that family. When oftentimes parents or family members shut down, you know, either children or minors or whoever it is that comes up with such reports, mm -hmm. you should be able to believe them and also, you know, know that it could happen or it has happened. Mm -hmm. And thereby, you know, don't push it away, don't push it under the rug, but support that person and investigate it further and then seek for help. Hannah to SN Program Officer, Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Program of the British Council. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And that's Insight this week. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to be a brother's keeper. It's the season of love and sharing. Make someone happy. Compliments of the season. We'll see you next week.